Okay. Hi everyone, so right now we are reading the Third Eye book and so far Lops and Grandpa has recently turned 12 and has taken the examination test and has finally become a llama. Now let's start reading the book. Can you see my screen? Yes, we do. At the present moment, as I looked around, the only thought in my mind was kites, man lifting kites. Tucked away in the lamasery building behind me were bars of spruce which had been bought from a far country, for no such tree grew in Tibet, and spruce probably from Assam were considered as ideal for kite construction, as it would take hard knocks to without fracturing and it was light and strong. After the kites were finished with, the wood would be examined and placed into a store ready for the next time. So they're saying on how to make the kites and on what to use, like what wood and where it came from. The discipline was not greatly relaxed here. We still had a midnight service and the others at regular intervals. This, if one thought about it, was the wisest way, as it will be harder to observe our long hours later if we relax now. The whole of our class time was devoted to her gathering and kite flying. Here in the lamasery, Clinging to the side of the mountain, we were still in daylight, while down below the ground was clothed in purple shadows, and the night wind could be heard rustling through the scant vegetation. The sun sank behind the far mountain peaks, and we too were in darkness. Below us, country looked like a black lake. Nowhere was there a glimmer of light. Nowhere so far as the eye could range was there a living creature except here in the group of holy buildings. With the going down of the sun, the night wind rose and set about the business of the gods, the dusting of the corners of the earth. As it swept along the valley below, it was trapped by the mountainside and was channeled up through faults in rock to emerge to our upper air with dull moaning boo, like a giant conch calling one to service. Around us there were the creaking and crackling of rocks moving and contracting now that the greater heat of the day had gone. Above us the stars were vivid in the dark night sky. The old people used to say that Kassar's Legions had dropped their spears on the floor of heaven at the call of Buddha. And the stars were the reflections of the lights of the heavenly room shining through the hole. So he is explaining about um, the view on what he can see and describing all around him. Suddenly a new sound was heard above the noise of the rising wind the temple trumpet sounding the close of yet another day. Up on the roof, as I looked, I could see dimly discern the silhouettes of monks, their robes fluttering in the breeze as they carried out their priestly office. For us, the trumpet's call meant bedtime until midnight. Dotted around the halls and temples were little groups of monks discussing the affairs of Lhasa and the wonderful well beyond. Discussing our beloved Dalai Lama in the greatest incarnation of any Dalai Lama. At the sound of the close of the day, they slowly dispersed and went their separate ways to bed. Gradually, the living sounds of the lamasery ceased, and there was the atmosphere of peace. I lay on my back, gazing up through a small window. For this night, I was too interested to sleep or want to sleep. The stars above and my whole life ahead. So much of it I knew, those things that have been predicted. So much have not been said. The predictions about Tibet, why 
Why did we have to be invaded? What have we done? A peace-loving country with no ambitions other than to develop spirituality. Why did the other nations convert our land? We decided nothing but that which was ours. Why then did other people want to conquer and enslave us? All we wanted was to be left alone, to follow our own way of life. And I was expected to go among those later would invade us, heal their sick and help their wounded in a war which had not been yet started, even started. I knew the predictions, knew the incidents and highlights, yet I had to go on a yak upon the trail, knowing all the stops and halting places, knowing where the grazing was bad yet to have yet to plod on a known destination. But maybe a yak coming over the ridge of the river to your prostration thought it was worthwhile why the sight of the holy city was. Booming of the temple drums woke me up with a start. I did not even know what I, that I had been asleep. With an unpriestly thought in my mind, I tottered to my feet, reaching with sleep numb hands for an e e elusive rope. Midnight, I shall never stay awake. Hope I don't fall over the steps. Oh, how cold this place is. 250 rules to obey as a llama. Well, there is one of them broken. For I did excel myself with the violence of my thoughts in being so abruptly awakened. Out I stumbled to join those others also in a daze who had arrived that day. Into the temple we went to join in the chant and counter chant of the service. So he's saying what's all happening outside. And there's like a chant service. It has been asked, well, if you knew all the pitfalls and hardships which have been predicted, why could you not avoid them? The most obvious answer to that is, if I could have avoided the predictions, then the mere fact of avoidance would be proven them false. Predictions are probabilities. They do not mean that man has no free will. Far from it, a, ma a man may want to go to Darjeeling to Washington. He knows his starting point and his destination. If he takes the trouble to consult a map, he will see certain places through which he would ordinarily pass to reach his destination. While it is possible to avoid the certain places, it is not always wise to do so. The journey may be longer or more expensive as a result. Similarly, one may motor from London to Inverness. The wise driver consults a map and has a road internary itinerary from one of the motoring organizations. And so, doing the driver can avoid bad roads or where he cannot avoid rough surfaces. He can be prepared and drive more slowly. So with the predictions, it does not always pay to take the soft and easy way. As a Buddhist, I believe in reincarnation. I believe that we come to earth to learn. When one is at school, it all seems very hard and bitter. The lessons, history, geography, arithmetic, whatever that may be, they may be, are dull, unnecessary, and pointless. So it appears to us at school. We, when, when we leave, we may possibly sigh for the good old school. We may be so proud of it that we wear a badge or tie even in a distinctive color on a monk's robe. So with life, it is hard, bitter, and lessons we have to learn are designed to try us and no one else. But when we leave school or off this earth, perhaps we wear our school badge with pride. Suddenly, I hope to wear my halo with a jaunty air later. Shocked? No Buddhist would be. Dying is merely living our old empty case and being reborn into a better world. 
With the morning light, we were up and anxious to explore. The older men were wanting to meet those that they had missed the night before. I wanted more than anything to see these huge man lifting kites. I heard so much about. So he's saying that I really want to see the man, the huge man lifting kites. First, first we had to be shown over the lamasery so that we could show our own way about. Up on the high roof, we looked about the towering peaks and gazed down at the fearsome ravines. Far away, I could see a turgid stream of yellow laden with water worn clay. Near the streams were the blue of the sky and rippling. In quiet moments, I could hear the happy tinkling of a little brook behind us as it, as it made its swift down the mountainside, eager to be off and join the tumbling waters of the rivers, which in India would become the mighty Brahmaputra River. Later to join the sacred Ganges and flow into the Bay of Bengal. The sun was rising above the mountains and the chill of the air fast vanished. Far away, we could see a lone vulture swooping in search of a morning meal. By my side, a respectful Lama pointed out features of interest. Respectful, because I had a ward of the well-loved love, Minga Dandab and respectful too, because I had the third eye and was proven incarnation or choku as we term it. It may possibly interest some to give brief details of recognizing an incarnation. The parents of boy may from his behavior think he had more knowledge than usual or in possession of certain memories, which cannot be explained by normal means. The parents will approach the abbot of a local lamasery to appoint a commission to examine the boy. Prima, preliminary pre-life horoscopes are made and the boy is physically examined for certain signs on the body. He should, for example, have certain peculiar marks on the hands, on the shoulder blades and on the legs. If these signs are to be seen, search in made for some clue as to who the boy was in his previous life. It may be that a group of lamas can recognize him, as in my case. And in, and in such events, some of his last life possessions will be available. These are produced together with others which are in appearance identical and the boy has to recognize all the articles, perhaps nine, which were in a previous life. He should be able to do this when he is three years of age. So he is explaining what they would do in an um, examination to this three-year-old boy. At three years of age, a boy is considered to be young, to be in influenced by his parents. Previous description of the articles. If the boy is younger, so much the better. Actually, it does not matter the least if parents to try to tell the boy how to act. They are not present during the time of choosing and the boy was to pick perhaps nine articles from possibly 30 to 30. Two wrongly selected will make a failure. If the boy is successful, then he is brought up a previous incarnation and his education is forced. At his seventh birthday, predictions of his future are read. And at that age, he deemed well able to understand everything said and implied. From my own experience, I know that he does understand. The respectful Lama at my side, no doubt uh, at all this in mind as he pointed out the features of the district. Over there to the right of the waterfall was a very suitable place for gathering Nomi Tangeri, the juice of which is used to remove corns and warts. 
and to alleviate, alleviate dropsy and jaundice. Over there, in that little lake, one could gather polygoram and hydropia, a reed with drooping spikes and pink flowers which grows underwater. We use the leaves for curing rheumatic pains and for relief of cholera. Here, were, here we gathered the ordinary type of herbs. Only the highlands would supply, supply rare plants. Some people are interested in herbs. So here are details of some of our more common types and uses to which we put them. The English names, if any, are quite unknown to me. So I will give the Latin names. So these are all the Latin names of the plants. Allium sativum is a very good antiseptic. It is also much used for asthma and other chest complaints. Another good antiseptic used in small doses only is Balsmodendron myra. This was used particularly for gums and mucous membranes. Taken internally, it always hysteria. A tall plant with cream colored flowers had a juice which thoroughly discouraged insects from biting. The Latin name for plant is Beconia cordata. So this is a, um, the Latin name for this plant. Perhaps the insects knew that and it was the name which had frightened them off. We also had a plant which was used to dilate the pupils of the eye. Ephedra sinica had a, has an action similar to astropine, and it is also very useful in case of low blood pressures besides being one of the greatest cures in Tibet for asthma. We use the dry and powered powdered branches and roots. Cholera was cholera often was unpleasant to the patient and doctor because the odor was ulcerate, ulcerated surfaces. Lingusticum levisticum killed all odor. A special note for the ladies. The Chinese used petals of hibiscus rosa sinensis to blacken both eyebrows and shoe leather. We use lotion made from both leaves to cool the body of feverish patients. Again, for the ladies, Lilum trig trigrinum really cures ovarian neuralgia, while Flacorita indica provides leaves which assist women to overcome most of their peculiar complaints. These are very strange names. Hmm. In Summer's Rust Group, the Bernicifera provides the Chinese and Japanese with the Chinese lacquer. We use the glabber for relief of diabetes, while the aromatica is of help in the cases of skin disease, urinary complaints, and cystitis. Another really powerful astringent use for use in bladder ulceration was made from the leaves of Artestaphalos uva rossi. The Chinese prefer Bignonia grandiflora from the flowers of which they made an estrogen for general use. In later years in prison camp, I found that polygonum bistora, bistorta was very useful indeed for in treating cases of chromatic dysentery, for which we used in Tibet. Ladies who had loved on wisely but well made from the use of estrogen prepared from polygonum erectinum a, a very useful method of securing abortion for others who had been burned we could apply a new skin 
side just back here orientalis is a tall plant some four feet high the flowers are yellow the juice applied to wound wounds mm -hmm. wounds and burns forms a new skin in much the same way as collodion taken internally the juice had an action similar to chamomile we used to coagulate the blood of wounds with piper agastifolium the other underside of the heart-shaped leaves is most efficient for the purpose all these are very common herbs most of the others have no latin names because they are known to the western world which bestows these des designations mm -hmm. I mentioned them here merely, merely to indicate that we had some knowledge of herbal medicine. From our vantage point, looking out over the countryside, we could see on this bright sunlit day the valleys and sheltered places where all these plants grew. Farther out, as we gaze beyond this small area, we could see the land becoming more and more desolate. I was told that the other side of the peak upon whose side the lamasari nestled was truly an ad arid de region. All this I could be able to see for myself when later in the week I soared higher above a man lifting kite. Later in the morning, the Lama Mingya donned up, called me and said, come along, love song. We will go with the others who are about to inspect the kite launching site. This should be your big day. So they're um, gonna launch the the kite the kite and at the launching site. It is need, needed no further remarks to get me to my feet eager to be off. Down at the main entrance, a group of red robe monks waited for us, and together we walked down the steps and along the jaunty tableland. There was not much vegetation up here. The ground was beaten earth over a solid rock shelf. A few sparse bushes clung to the side of the rock as it afraid of sliding over the edge and down into the ravine below. Up above us, on the roof of the lamasery, prayer flags were held stiff and rigid by the wind. Every now and then the masts creaked and groaned with the strain, as they had done for ages past, and held. Nearby, a small novice idly scuffed the earth with his boot, and the force of the breeze whipped away the dust like a puff of smoke. We walked towards one rocky edge of the long tableland, the edge of which the peak soared up into the gentle slope. Our robes were pressed tight against our backs and billowed out in front, pushing us, making it difficult not to break into a run. About 20 or 30 feet from the edge was a crevice in the ground. From it, the wind was shot with gale force, sometimes projecting small stones and bits of lichen into the air, like speeding arrows. Wind sweeping along the valley far below was trapped by the rock formations and piling up with no easier mode of exit. Pulled up at a high pressure through the fault in the rock, finally to emerge at the tableland with a shriek of power at being free again. Sometimes during the seasons of gales, we were told the noise like the roaring demons escaping from the deepest pit and ravening for victims. Wind surging and gusting in the ravine far below altered the pressure in the fault and note rose and fell accordingly but now on this morning the 
current of air was constant. I could well believe the tales were told of small boys walking into the blast and being blown straight off their feet up into the air to fall perhaps 2,000 feet down to the rocks at the base of the crevice. It was a very useful spot from the witch to launch a kite. Though because the force was such that a kite would be rising, would be able to rise straight up. We were shown this with smaller kites similar to those I used to fly when I was a small boy at home. I, it was most surprisingly to hold the string and find one's arm lifted strongly by even the smallest toy kite. We were led along the whole rocky shelf and the experienced men were us pointed out dangers to avoid peaks, which were known to have treacherous danger of air or those which seemed to attract one sideways. We were told that each monk who flew must carry a stone with him, to which was attracted a silk cutter, mm-hmm. attached a silk cutter inscribed with prayers to the gods of the air to bless this. A newcomer to their domain, this stone had to be cast to the winds when one was of sufficient height. Then the gods of the winds would read the prayer as the cloth unrolled and steamed out and so it was hoped that they would protect the kite rider from all harm. Back in the Lamasari, there were so much scurrying about as we carried out the materials with which to assemble the kites. Everything was carefully inspected. The spruce wood poles exact examined inch by inch to make certain that they were free from flaws or any other damage. The silk which the kite were to cover with unrolled upon a smooth clean floor. Monks on hands and knees crept about in order to carefully to test and view every square foot. With the examiners satisfied the fate framework was lashed into the position and little retaining wedges rammed home. This kite was of box form, about eight feet square and about 10 feet long. Wings extended eight or nine feet from the two horizontal lines. Beneath the tips, there had to be fixed bamboo half hoops to act as skids and to protect the wings when taking off and landing. At the floor of the kite wheel was strengthened, there was a long bamboo skid which tapped upwards like a Tibetan boots. This particular pole was thick as my wrist and was strutted so that even with the kite at rest, there were no ground touching the silk. The skid and wing protectors preventing it. I was not at all happy at the first sight of the rope of yak hair. It looked flimsy. A V of it was fastened to the wing roots and reached to the front of the skid. Two monks picked up the kite and carried it to the end of the flat tableland. It was quite struggling, lifting it over the updraw of air, and many monks had been told had to hold it and carry it across. Should we stop it there? No. Um, read it for five more minutes, ready? Okay. Or a little bit more than that? Okay. First, there was to be a trial. For this, we were going to hold the rope and pull instead of using horses. A party of monks held the rope and the kite master watched carefully. 
As signal, they ran as fast as they could, dragging the kite with them. It hit the airstream from the fissure, the fissure in the rock, and up into the air it leapt like a huge bird. The monks handled the rope were very experienced, and they soon paid out the rope so that the kite could rise higher and higher. They held the line firmly and one monk, tucking his robe around his waist, climbed the rope up rope for ten, about 10 feet to test the lifting power. Another followed him and the two moved up so that a third man could try. The airlift was enough to support two grown men and one boy, but not quite enough for three men. This was not good enough for the kite master. So the monks hold in the rope, making very sure that the kite avoided the rising air current. We all moved from the landing area except for the monks on which rope and two more to steady the kite as it landed. Down it came seemingly reluctant to the come of the earth have after having the freedom of the skies. With a soft sh shish, it sl slid to a standstill, which the two monks holding the wing tips. Under the instruction of the kite master, we tightened the silk everywhere, driving little wooden wedges into the split poles to hold it firmly. And do that, just the bottom half, do. The wings, were, the wings were taken off and replaced at a somehow different angle and the kite was tried again. This time it supported three grown men with ease and almost lifted the small boy as well. The kite master said that it was satisfactory and now we could try the kite with a man weight stern attached to it. Once again, the crowd of monks struggled to hold down the kite as they went across the updrop. Once again, monks pulled on the rope and up into the air, jumped kite and stern. The air was turbulent and the kite bobbed and swayed. It did queer things to my stomach as I watched and thought of being up there. The, tie, the kai was brought down and carried across the starting point. An experienced lama spoke to me. I will go up first and then it will be your turn. Watch me carefully. He led me to the skid. Observe how I put my feet here on this wood. Link both arms over this crossbar behind you. When you are air Born, step down into the V and sit on this thickened part of the rope. As you land, you are 8 to 10 feet in the air. Jump. It is the safest way. Now I will fly and you can watch. It is time the horses have been hitched to the rope. As the llama gave the signal, the horses were urged forward at a gallop. The kite slid forward, hit the up draw, and leapt into the air. When it was a hundred feet above us, or two or three thousand feet above rocks below, the llama slid down the rope to the V, where he sat swaying. Higher and higher he went. A group of monks pulling on the rope and paying it out so that the height, the height could be gained. Then the llama above kicked hard on the rope as a signal, and the men began hauling in. Gradually, it came lower and lower, swaying and twisting as kites will. Twenty feet, ten feet, and the llama was hanging by its hands. He let go, and he hit hard. He hit. He hit ground. He turned a somersault and regained his feet. Dusting his road with his hands, he turned to me and said, Now it's your turn, Lobsang. Show us what you can do. Should we stop there, Joshua, or keep on continuing? We can stop now, baby. Okay. Mm. 
stop sharing screen. Okay. Um, now ask everyone in the order you can see on the screen. Um, you know, okay. So first, Heather, do you have any questions or any feedback? Yeah, Ridhi, you have explained it very well. Thank you, Heather. Joshua, do you have any questions or feedback? Um, feedback would be, um, Ridhi, you said it very, very good today. Mm -hmm. But actually, you should explain a little bit more clearly, a little bit more. Okay. Just improve okay. a little bit on that. Yeah. Okay. Mukund, do you have any questions or feedback? So, um, I think um, my favorite part was the kites thing. But um, a little uh, uh, question. Did um did Lop Sang Rampa make the kite? Um yeah, he did, but like the other people like helped him make it, like using the wood and yeah. Oh, okay. I also thought like that. And by the mm -hmm. way, good job, Riddhi. Um the there's like some hard words, but you still are very really resilient. Um very good job on that. Thank you, Mukund. Uh, Radhan, do you have any questions or feedback? Okay. Ryan, do you have any questions or feedback? Okay, so he might not be there. So we can stop recording now. Okay.